The doctrine of original sin is one of the most harmful teachings of Christianity, especially as it's interpreted by evangelical Christianity. And it's also psychologically unsound. It doesn't actually make sense of how human psychology works. It doesn't explain why people do harmful and hurtful things. Nor does it help us to rectify the problems that we have. So this teaching is really based off of the ideas of the Apostle Paul, who taught that sin entered the world through Adam and Eve's disobedience. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from God. They, they fell, and human nature itself was tainted and fallen as a result. And as a result of their sin, the whole human race and creation was cursed and falls under God's wrath and into this sinful state where our nature is fundamentally oriented towards evil. And we genetically participate in the sin of Adam and Eve. We receive their sin as our own sinful nature just through being born. So before you do anything good or bad, you're already damned to hell. You are already sinful. You're born a sinful being. It doesn't even have to do with what you do. Just by being human, your default condition is hellfire damnation. And this is so twisted and perverted. I mean, what mother looks at her newborn child and thinks, look at this wicked, wicked being deserving of damnation. Woe is you. Woe is me for bearing you. I mean, no, you think, look at this beautiful, beautiful being. I want to shower all of my love unconditionally on it, right? That's the natural nature response to a newborn being, not to view it as wicked and evil and sinful, but this is literally what is taught. And you're taught that you're totally depraved, that every single orientation of your mind, your emotions, the desires of your heart, your intuition, everything is out of alignment and you can't trust yourself because of this, your sinful nature, because you are a sinner. And so what can you do if you can't trust yourself? Well, trust the church, trust the Bible, trust someone else's authority to save you. You need an outside power to take over and to intervene for you and to, to possess your soul. You need the Holy Spirit to possess you and take you over and heal you from your own personal agency. Uh, so really here, this places so much guilt and shame on a human being that you are wicked, you're oriented towards evil, and you deserve God's wrath. That, and, and the orientation to the universe and life becomes one of fear because I'm fundamentally born into a wrathful, destructive, hostile universe on a cosmic scale. Uh, so I have to do whatever I can to appease this wrathful deity. And it's taught that Jesus forgives you of your sin. Uh, but even then, you're always having to confess and measure up, and you never quite know if you're good enough or right with God. There's still this, this standard here of, of having to account for your wickedness, and your, the idea that you are a sinner or that you have a sinful nature is constantly reinforced. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of a back and forth, well, you're saved, well, you're good enough, but then also, well, you're a sinner, well, you're depraved, and it's never really the unconditional love thing that is preached about is not actual. It's theoretical, it's hypothetical. Uh, there's one set of teachings that teach you unconditional love, and then a whole other set of teachings that teaches you that you are a sinner, that you're weak, that you can't trust yourself, uh, so these teachings are meshed together in this hodgepodge of, of confusion and abuse. It's very, very abusive to teach people that they're born deserving damnation. and They should be terrified and ashamed just for being human. And so really, I think actually that the fundamentalist evangelical interpretation of the doctrine of original sin, there's, there's more than one idea of original sin, but I think this one actually is the most faithful to what the Bible says. Like, I think they actually got the Apostle Paul right here. Um, but whether or not you want to agree with that, that's fine. I mean, 
I think more progressive interpretations that don't see it this way, if, if, if you take a, a looser interpretation to these scriptures or uh, if you downplay them, I think that's, that's great if you happen to be a Christian. But really, I think this whole idea of sinfulness and a fallen sinful nature is flawed from the get-go. It doesn't actually make sense of the human condition. It's not a valid way of conceptualizing what's really happening here. Uh, so in this perspective, suffering and evil are a result of depravity and wickedness, of, of people making a, a hostile bad choice. It's really the idea that there are, that there's fundamental goodness and fundamental badness. And there's good people and there's bad people. And really in this idea, everyone, all the people are bad. Uh, but the people who get saved end up being the good people. And really, uh, there is such a thing as evil. I believe that there's such a thing as evil. But I don't believe that it really makes sense to say that people are fundamentally flawed or broken. I think that people do evil things for uh, reasons that make sense and that don't have to do with people being tainted or distorted or, or fallen or somehow uh, deplorable. Everyone, I think, is doing the best with the knowledge and state of consciousness that they have, the level of awareness of how to meet their own needs. So a lot of times for various psychological reasons, uh, different traumas people experience, the way they were raised by abusive parents or, or different situations, the way they react to that, they meet their needs or adapt in ways that create harm to themselves and to other people. And this includes malicious intent. Uh, you know, people wish harm upon others for a reason. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. Uh, there, there have been forces in their lives that conditioned them that way. Uh, even if it's a, something genetic or biological, something with the brain that, uh, where, say, there's a lack of empathy, you know, people don't choose that because they're bad. They, ch they choose it because that's what's available to them within their biology, within their awareness, within their ignorance, within their lack of knowledge. Uh, same thing with why I say people lie or steal. They do it because it's adaptive. They do it because they're trying to meet their needs or because that's how they were conditioned. So it's not that the person's bad or evil. It's just that that's what is available to them with the level of knowledge, education, awareness, and the cultivation of their state of consciousness. Their, uh, ability to access love, the, their ability to be self-reflective, their level of privilege, their socioeconomic status, uh, the, how, whether they've been oppressed by systems of injustice. And so there's so many different reasons that we know of in psychology as to why people do evil things, including sociopathy, including genocide, including the worst possibilities for what humans can do in terms of evil. I don't think it ever makes sense to condemn the person, ever. I'm talking the worst genociders of history. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to say that you are deserving of infinite wrath and torture and there's no rehabilitation possible for you. I mean, it may be the case that we can't rehabilitate these people, uh, you know, on this earth plane with our technology or research. I'm not, so I'm not saying that we shouldn't hold people accountable. Of course we should. But what I'm saying is it doesn't make sense to dehumanize anyone, including the people who do the most egregious things, because the reason they do those things is because of their ignorance and lack of awareness. They're confined by their own minds. And if they were able to do differently and better, if, if they could, then they would. You know, if these people who do horrible things were resourced and somehow able to see differently a, a higher way of meeting their needs, then of course they would choose that. That is human nature, actually, is to choose the, the, the best way that you know how, not the worst way. Um, and, and, and so I don't think it makes sense, really, to say that this evil thing is inherent to our nature. I think 
it's inherent to just the way reality is that we, uh, being a conscious agent, being a conscious being, we have this spectrum of states of consciousness and choices available to us. And, you know, it, it makes sense that we choose some that are on a, a higher, more elevated plane and others that are, are more, that are lower and that are less helpful and less wise and less artful. And really, Buddhism and Hinduism, Eastern philosophy and Eastern psychology, I think has a much more sophisticated framework for dealing with this than a lot of Western type Judeo-Christian thinking, which goes into this psychological split between good and evil. There's the good people and the bad people. It's very black and white. It's very simplistic. Whereas Eastern type philosophy uh, tends to view things in terms of level of awareness, le uh, knowledge and ignorance, and uh, the, the conditioning of our conscious state of awareness. And that, that really no one is evil. And the people who do the most evil actually uh, suffer the most. They do, the, and they may not suffer the most physically. They may have a lot of great things, but their consciousness is in a state of affliction, in a sense, or distortion. Uh, th there's a lot of suffering in being caught in, in creating evil, maybe even if you're not aware of it, maybe if it feels good to you and you are never held accountable. And I think it, it makes sense to say there's a kind of enslavement in that perversion. But that's my view anyway. And my view also is that because, because of this, we should have compassion on people who do harm and compassion on people who do evil and not hate them and not judge them to hell. So this is really original sin and this whole uh, Christian especially fundamentalist view of, of evil. I know uh, not all Christians believe in this. Uh, some are more universal. They, they view salvation as universal. They don't believe in hell. But th this kind of a view that is all heavily emphasized in the Bible, definitely a lot of Bible is into this view, <laughs> is really unhealthy and based on hatred based on condemnation, based on judgment. It's an evil perspective. This perspective in itself uh, perpetrates evil. It results in people having hardened hearts and not being able to integrate the whole of humanity, not being able to show compassion to people who harm them. It, in some ways, it's the opposite of Jesus' teaching to, to love your enemies. It, it's this whole judgmental posture to other people. And I think it makes sense to even, to show compassion towards people who are suffering from their own lower level of awareness, from their own ignorance, and that that compassion, that loving kindness is the only way to heal ourselves when we are afflicted by their wrongdoing, and the only way to possibly rehabilitate and help them. Because when we see them not as evil or fundamentally flawed, then we can come up with creative solutions to rehabilitate and help them on, on greater societal scale. Again, not maybe, maybe not everyone, uh, but maybe there are ways of, of helping a lot of these people heal that we've counted out. I'm, I'm not even saying just all the extreme cases, but uh, when people are shown compassion and, uh, and love, like unconditional positive regard, that's so powerful. I mean, the level of transformation that's possible from that is could be labeled miraculous. Uh, you know, I don't want to underestimate what what would happen if humanity was able to embrace loving kindness and compassion towards people who have malicious intent or who do bad things or who wrong us. And this original sin, the sinful nature of you doesn't do that. Uh, it also really harms people who believe in it. It's it, one of the biggest religious traumas that's out there is self-damnation, is, is the self-hatred that results from this teaching, viewing yourself as unworthy, depraved, broken, uh, fundamentally broken, unwhole and unwell and unhealable, needing to be saved from the outside. And 
I, I mean, I believe that every human being is fundamentally deserving of love, and in, in a sense, fundamentally well-intentioned, in that what's more natural for us is to want things that help us and that help the collective species uh, to the best extent that we can, that that's more natural than just harming and, and disobeying and, and, and this rebellious, it's just, it's silly to me. I'm sorry, it's really silly to me at this point. Uh, and it, again, it, it contradicts, I think, almost every notion of psychology that I know of and a lot of these other philosophies, again, of the East and other mystical and spiritual type traditions that really are more loving. This unconditional love thing, I think, is possible. And again, to really fight evil, to aggressively resist it and to not tolerate it, and we can be angry at it and have our rage and, and all of that, uh, but, but still to be able to see in all of that that people are doing the best that they can and that, you know, what we want here is not for people to suffer eternally, even if they've done horrible things. The best possible scenario is for people to be healed and rehabilitated and for us to live in a state of compassion for ourselves and for others. And that is not the vision of this apocalyptic vision of, of the Bible and original sin. So, my name is Andrew Jasko. I'm the founder of lifeafterdogma.org. I help people heal from their religious trauma and find a healthy, authentic connection to spirituality on their own terms that works for them, whether that's religious or secular or whatever, however you want to define that term, spiritual. A deep sense of connection and meaning and purpose and wholeness. So you can click at the bottom of this video. There's a link for an inner freedom breakthrough session for a consultation with me. I offer coaching for healing. Uh, there's a lot of articles on my website as well. Thank you so much.